It's time for COIL and web monetization. I'm Ben Sharafian. I work at COIL as the CTO, and I'm also one of the co-founders. And basically, I'm going to be talking about web monetization, which is the, it's the inner ledger standard for essentially the product that, that COIL is providing. And I'll walk through what that means, um, how you can use it, when you should use it, and what some of the sort of existing sort of alternatives are that, that this solves the flaws of. I don't want to go too technical, so this is going to be an illustrated walkthrough of how you can solve your problems with web monetization. So let's start with the problem that you have. So if you're a content creator, maybe you're a developer, you're creating things that you then want to make money off of. Because if you're making things, it's going to take a lot of time to create them with quality and everything, so you want to be able to make money for that time. In this example, we've got our person who's sort of like Looks like a frog person. I did all of the illustrations myself, which I say not to take credit, but because I don't want our design team to get blamed for it. Um, yeah, this person's got a painting in this case. So just to illustrate with a uh, you know, physical scenario what would be happening for you probably over the internet of trying to distribute your content. So how do I monetize my project without giving a crappy experience? That's the crux of it. So the types of monetization that you could do today to make some money off of your product or your content, the first one that might be obvious is like retail style payments. So I have my content, I put it online and I say, if you go through this checkout flow and pay for it, you can look at it. The problem is that it's kind of a headache for the user. It takes a lot of user interaction. So to go through a checkout flow, you're, you're pressing a button, you're entering your card details, Maybe if you're using web payments, um, it's a little easier. You could even use Interledger for that. But this type of interaction just doesn't scale when you view so many articles a day, so many things online. The other problem is that right now, there's a lot of competing ways to do this. So even if I'm taking credit cards, I've got to pick a processor for that. And my code isn't going to work. You know, I have to pick one when I actually write the code to process payments. If I'm using a cryptocurrency, I typically need to pick one. That said, you know, once we have Interledger, this is gonna get a little bit better once we have that available to use on the web. But today, the situation's pretty bleak. This, this person is trying to sell his painting for $50 because that's the only transaction size that really makes sense to do a card payment. So not gonna go so well for him. The next possible situation is advertising, which has its benefits. It basically allows you to pay indirectly through your future purchases, which is pretty cool. Advertiser pays me, then a different user is going to go see that ad and pay the advertiser, thus completing the cycle. And the problem there is that the advertiser obviously wants to save costs. They want to make their money go as far as possible. And so basically what they're going to do is try to collect all your data to make sure that you do make those purchases in the future if they're paying for the ad. The other problem is that Again, from a UX uh, perspective, this kind of sucks. You know, I have to look at an ad every time I see content. I have to look at several ads usually because they don't make very much money. And so you're going to opt out a lot of the time. So you've got a couple people here looking at this beautiful painting who are uh, obscuring their identities and therefore our poor creator is not monetizing off of them. You've also got, you know, Facebook over here collecting all the data and uh, not giving that much money to the actual creator who put all the work in to do this. So that's where I think web monetization sort of get you the best of both approaches. Basically open micropayments. And so this sort of illustration sort of illustrates how different this is from existing methods in that trying to imagine this as an actual physical scenario is pretty absurd. But with Interledger, you can actually do this quite practically on the web. Basically, every time you're looking at um, the, the content, every, in this case, every time these people are looking at the painting, they're sending some money every second to the creator. And so this has a few benefits. For one, the technology itself is totally decoupled from what companies or currencies you're using. So if you're using you know, payment processors online, or if you're using an ad network, or even if you're using some other micropayment solutions that are proprietary where you have to have a relationship with one company, um, you're basically, you're getting lock-in. And with web monetization, you're not getting any lock-in. You're just using Interledger, which means you can switch providers. 
and anybody going to your site is going to have the same experience. Another major advantage is no user interaction, which is something we had with ads, but in this case, it can now happen in a way where the user's privacy is preserved and also the user doesn't have to have to look at any ads. Now the downsides here, if you were to just say, okay, fire up your, your inner ledger wallet and you know, attach it to your browser and then start paying to every site you go to that uses web monetization, is that it's kind of scary to be paying out of your own money. And that's something a lot of people aren't going to be comfortable with. I mean, some people will. Some people do want to donate to the sites that they go to or pay for content on the sites that they go to if given the opportunity. But most people would rather have just a subscription that covers it for them. And so that's sort of what we aim to do with COIL. COIL is basically taking web micropayments through web monetization and making it accessible for anybody. Anybody who has a credit card can get a COIL account. It's a flat rate, so you pay $5 a month and then that allows you to go to sites as much as you want. And essentially, what Coil's doing is they're the one paying the site over Interlecture. So I just get the content, Coil's the one paying the creator. And so I sort of get the, the best possible experience through that. Now the interesting thing there is because it's still built on the web monetization protocol, you're not locked into Coil either. So if I switch from Coil to a competing provider who offers web monetization, if I just decide I want to start running it out of my own crypto wallet or something, you're free to do that and you're going to be able to access the same sites and the same content, which I think is a really important detail that there's one, there's sort of one pool of content that uses web monetization and everybody's kind of in it together. So that's kind of the overview of why you would want to use web monetization and why it solves the problems that exist today. So I want to go quickly over some technical details of it. And this is going to be pretty quick. There's going to be time later, I think tomorrow, there's some time to develop, and if anybody wants to come talk to me about that, then I would be happy to help with some more advanced uses of web monetization. But basically, at its core, web monetization is the following HTML tag, which is, you say, the name of this meta, of this, you know, meta tag is monetization, and the content is your inner ledger payment pointer, which your, uh, your inner ledger payment pointer is essentially like your email address or you could say like your routing number for money. It's where you receive money on Interledger. It's how you tell people how to get there. So you can just go to any wallet that supports Interledger, which right now, um, the easiest way to do that is XRP Tipbot, get a payment pointer, and then put it on your site. And now anybody who uses Coil and goes to your site can just start paying you. So I've actually got Strata's site open from the tutorial before. They've got Coil enabled. So when I go to their site, Every second, there's a micropayment going to them. But I want to show you how you could use this as a developer as well, because there's a lot of flexibility with this, and there's a lot of different cool things that you could do. I've basically prepared like a, a sort of test page that shows how to use web monetization and what the different um, things you can use from JavaScript are to have more advanced functionality. So on this page, it basically logs all the events that are happening with web monetization. So you can see it tells you when it started paying, it tells you every time a micropayment goes through. And so with those pretty simple tools, you can do a lot of advanced things on your site. You could say, um, display a message when a user is web monetized. You could show a piece of content if a user is web monetized. You could show ads if they're not web monetized. It's pretty much up to you. The idea is just to provide a lot of flexibility there. So I went through all of that pretty quick. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, so uh, you're talking about flexibility. If a user has determines, how, how do they determine the value of their content and the value that they're willing to receive per second of content? Maybe you've got more premium content that only mm -hmm. a user is willing to pay more. Yeah, is that's there, a great question. Is there any flexibility in the streaming amount? Yeah, so I think it's there's kind of what is technically possible and what is good to do from a user's experience. So of course with Interledger, um, these are just micropayments and if you're, you're receiving them in a wallet, there's no distinction between web monetization and any other payment you'd be receiving. So if you want to, you can, you can just um, serve up content when a specific amount is reached. You could say, if you uh, spend enough time on my page, 
to accumulate a dollar, then this content gets unlocked. But that's a pretty poor user experience because it means the user has to, has to wait around on your page. So that's not really, it's not really meant to replace that sort of retail payments use case. So I think a better way to sort of think about it is in terms of bandwidth. And that's actually how, how Coil thinks about it too, is as a user, you have, uh, you have bandwidth according to how, what tier your subscription is kind of. And so the basic subscription that Coil offers right now will pay 100 micro dollars, 100 millionths of a dollar per second of browsing. And so as a site, I could detect, here's a user that's on my page, they're paying me 100 micro dollars per second, and so that unlocks the 100 micro dollars per second tier of content. That said, there's not that much content on web monetization right now, and so fragmenting it into multiple tiers might be a bit premature. It sounds really appropriate for a, a site that's serving videos of Absolutely. very re resolutions. Yeah. You could be someone that demands a very high resolution video and only serve that if they're a premium subscriber. Yeah, I think, we're, I think with um, Cinnamon, who's basically doing this use case of, of web monetization to pay for video, I think those sort of things make a lot of sense of paying different bandwidths for different resolutions. If you're subscribing in general at one tier, this is really the same, just elaborating on the same question. Okay. Uh, and there's a particular site you become aware of, maybe you follow the link, it's only available at a higher tier. Can you effectively switch to that higher tier just while visiting the site? That's basically a detail of the coil subscription itself, which is sort of a direction we haven't gone yet in the product. We right now only offer one tier just to keep things simple, but I could imagine in the future, let's say you were running a wallet yourself to pay for web monetization. You could adjust it in real time if you wanted to. Um, with coil, maybe you could have a way in the extension to, to boost a particular site. It's really, um, the standard itself is pretty much agnostic as to how you actually determine what bandwidth you're gonna pay. And how does the receiver, how does the site itself uh, determine that the stream of money that it's receiving is associated with the uh, session in which it's providing the content? Yeah, so I can actually show you here on this page. It's a little hard to see, but there's a request ID that comes on the first start request. And so when the, when the event that web monetization has started comes through, it carries a little okay. ID, and then the server can use that to associate with your payment. It's unique per page load, though, to make sure that it's not a fingerprinting mechanism. Um, you had a question? Yeah, how do you oh. distinguish between you know, browsing a website and I left my browser window open? Yeah, again, that's, that's really up to the person who's providing it. So for Coil, right now what we do is we make sure the tab isn't backgrounded, which is kind of a sanity check, and we also make sure the pointer hasn't been idle for too long. Um, for, for other services, like if you were running maybe your own, well, you might have different preferences there. You might be, maybe you'd be stricter about it, maybe you'd be more lax, but it's really, it's really up to the individual provider of web monetization. And I think that's actually an important detail of web monetization as opposed to other, um, other payment mechanisms is that you can basically have all these different providers who have unique features among them, but they're all accessing the same content. So it's kind of like having a standard way to express, here's how you can pay for this content, and then the actual providers of it get to, you can choose them among who has the best unique offerings and features without, without having to say, okay, Netflix has a better user interface than Hulu, but it doesn't have the show that I want on it. You, don't, you wouldn't have that problem anymore. So you said one micro dollar every uh, second. A hundred micro dollars every second. A hundred micro dollars. So 10,000 seconds would be one um, dollar? That uh, sounds correct. So it would be about 15, 25 minutes before you spend five dollars. That's your subscription. What if you go over? That doesn't sound right. No? But, but yes, there is a point where you do go over. I'm not certain how many seconds it is off the top of my head, but yeah, basically if you go over with your subscription, if you're, if you're uh, using Coil, then Coil will actually just pay that out of our pockets. And it's kind of like 
it's, it's a pretty easy equation that with any subscription service where the, the actual service itself is costing money to the provider, you're going to have some users who, who underuse and some who overuse. And so we just take a loss on the ones who, who overuse and we take a profit on the ones who underuse. If you were running it yourself, say like out of a, out of a wallet on your own machine, then it just becomes, well, how much money do you have slash are willing to spend? So how do you prevent like situations where I launch my own browsers to watch my own site and I pay five dollars or dollars and then I make profit off of it? I mean, on Coil, we do see that kind of usage happening and it's really just like, just having better tools to recognize that. It's, it's tricky because we also want to respect privacy, so we can't tell what site you're on. But there are markers that show when somebody's sort of gaming the system, like if they're streaming for 24 hours straight to the one site. Okay. Thanks. Um, you know, part of the beauty of this is it's an open network built around a standard, which means that if I'm a Coil user, I don't have to rely on it being like Coil acquired websites. It could be any website that uses the web monetization standard. At the same time, if I'm a publisher and I'm operating your website, I don't have to rely on it just being Coil users to get paid. It could come, come from kind of any wallet or any service that's, that's uh, using the standard. From Coil's perspective, though, um, how do you think about the defensibility of the business? Like, given that open standard, how do you think about um, creating stickiness either among websites or users? And the reason I'm asking that is just because if there are other developers in the room today who are thinking about building these businesses, how, how should they think about kind of moats around uh, the service they would build around web monetization. So the question is basically, how does COIL have a moat if web monetization is an open standard? Like how does COIL have a sustainable business model? Correct. Okay, yeah, so I think the fundamental part of it that I think we don't want to, to tamper with is the fact that if you have web monetization on a site, then all the different web monetization providers can access it equally. Kind of like web, uh, net neutrality for web monetization. Um, but I think there are still a lot of ways that you can offer something unique as a provider of web monetization. Maybe you have things like really advanced ways to adjust the bandwidth. So let's say some video content is, requires a higher bandwidth, but a text-based uh, text article doesn't require very high bandwidth. We might pay a higher amount on that high-resolution video than on some text-based content to make sure that as a user you get the right, you get the best experience. And that's something that does take a lot of tuning and a lot of, um, you know, a lot of learning from the different usage of the platform in order to get right. So that's something that potentially different providers might solve in different ways. You might have one that has a possibility like to finely tune how much you're paying to a given site. And that might be desirable to, to some other people. So I think it's really around how do you pick how much you pay to these different sites? And then also just sort of side benefits around how, um, how nice the experience is of, of signing up for it, of managing your, your account, that kind of thing. I mean, with Coil, we also offer things like, like an OAuth API so that if a site wants to let you sign in with Coil, they could, they could do that. And that just means there's one fewer accounts you need to have. They could let you sign in, and then they know you're web monetized as well. Is Coil going the subscription route? Are you going to roll out different levels of subscription? Because you've been at $5 for, well, mm -hmm. since you began. So. We may at some point go for that. I mean, it's obviously not set in stone. But I think I could see the ecosystem evolving in that way, where it makes sense to have different, different sort of tiers of subscription. But Really, right now, there's not that much on Coil yet. And so I think fragmenting the, the sort of value proposition into different groups would, would just kind of, it would mean you have five different subscriptions, none of which has enough content to make it worthwhile, versus one that does make it worthwhile. How does the idea of users and identifying users or not identifying users, whether it's uh, someone that's a content creator, how do they identify if they're going through uh, just this regular payment pointer or, or coil and all that? What's the interaction? You mean how does the how does the site tell who's paying it? Yeah, I'm wondering if 
you know, this idea of a user versus just the payment pointer versus subscriptions and all of that. Um, you know, if a content creator doesn't want to necessarily um, have a user account base and manage accounts that they have, uh -huh. is there an API where I can understand? Yeah, yeah you basically, you don't need uh, any kind of user. You don't need to have an account for a user in order to, to take to take web monetization payment from that. Right, you it's just something have, to have you the could, payment pointer. And yeah, if you have the payment pointer on the site and then a user goes to your page, you can associate the, the stream of money that the user is um, giving to you with, the, with your actual backend and then serve them content based on that. So, I mean, that does also, yeah, that really lifts another barrier, which is if I want to go to a news site and pay for a pay for a piece of content, not only do I have to pay, I now have to have another account with them that I need to maintain. And web monetization can get rid of that. How do you think uh, people will feel about paying to go to sites? Well, we already do pay to go to sites a lot of the time. I think we just get, we just pay a lot of different times to go to sites. And I think having a more unified way to do it is probably going to be a relief to a lot of people. But for example, CNN News. Uh -huh. You go on the news site, read them. It's free for everyone to read the news, and they can avoid the ads or ad blockers, right? But they don't have to pay. Yeah, I think it's less compelling than to take a site that right now has advertisement and then just say, okay, well, if you pay, you don't see ads anymore. I don't think that's a very compelling proposition, which is why I think probably the sites that we're going to see being really successful in web monetization are kind of the new types of content that it enables. So not just take the content that exists today and maybe remove the ads on it and add web monetization to it, but create a new piece of content that requires web monetization in order to be viable. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>